in Turkey, and I'm very happy to see uh, uh, the audience from a Turkish uh, academic circle and uh, also uh, the Japan studies circle. So today's uh, topic, QUAD, uh, if you are in political science, international relations, uh, especially in international relations, these days you hear this uh, four letters Q U A D uh, on a daily basis, and quad of course stands for a quadrilateral, which means four countries, and which four? Uh, Japan is one of them, and the United States another, Australia and India. So these four countries are currently spoken as Quad members. They have uh, regularized their uh, high-level meetings in recent years. Uh, initially, foreign ministers meeting, but uh, uh, it's possibly going to grow into a regularized uh, summit-level meeting. So. Well, meeting is one thing. Uh, of course, closer relationship among these four countries is now symbolized by those regularized meetings. But uh, in addition to that, uh, closer security cooperation is also developing among the four countries. Today, uh, there is a news uh, featured about the, the joint naval uh, kind of passage operations through the East China Sea by Japan, US, Australia, and not India this time, but France. Okay. So uh, things of this nature, involving, uh, if not all four quad members, oftentimes three quad members, and definitely two quad members, are uh, happening more regularly. And you see more of those news on a daily basis. So why is quad getting closer? Yeah. The Realists who tend to see the world in a kind of zero sum fashion, you know, my gain is your loss, ha ha, you know, that kind of view. And also uh, very much focused on security dilemma, the arms race and competition and all that. They have a simple answer. Quad is growing because China's getting bigger and more powerful, period. Everybody wants to contain China because it's a scary country. So that, that's the kind of realist answer to this uh, quad phenomenon. But uh, I have been arguing that uh, each quad member has overlapping but somewhat divergent objectives. And so it's a case of a, you know, a same bed, different dreams. And when you have four parties on the same bed, that could get naughty. And today I am going to talk about uh, as my title says, Japan's view of quad. Okay. What is the kind of uh, image Japan has about the quad? Okay. So I'll speak of this topic in relations to uh, some other parties, but uh, the main focus will be Japan and, and also uh, among the four quad members, I'll probably talk more on Japan-India partnerships 
rather than Japan, US or Japan, Australia. Not Japan, US this time because uh, well, I've been talking about Japan, US for <laughs> pretty much for my entire academic career. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I could just bore myself, you know, talking about the same thing over and over. But uh, uh, well, many people have spoken of Japan US relations, and especially during the, the tenure of Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, US Japan relations got a lot closer. And in a way, very much consistent with the realist would explain. So, so that part is not much of a big puzzle, unless you know you are you are trained under the kind of constructivist school, who put a lot of emphasis on. Japan's, you know, the pacifist culture and constitution and, you know, left-leaning public opinion, anti-militarism and so forth. They were surprised by the Abe period. Oh my God, Japan made a 180 degree turn all of a sudden. But, you know, I have been telling them that, that they are overemphasizing this pacifist culture. And when Abe was successfully making those changes, to me, it looked more like a continuity mm -hmm. than a drastic change. Yeah. So actually that argument is made, here is my advertisement. <laughs> that argument was made in our most recent co-edited book with uh, the Mihail Komash, who is from uh, Czech Republic. And uh, yeah, this book, Culture and Identity in Japanese Foreign Policy, talks about this. And we, we counter argue against uh, the constructivist uh, interpretation of what's happening. Yeah. But anyway, there's nothing surprising in the US-Japan relations. The Japan-Australia relations, you know, it has grown from uh, much earlier. Australia, Japan, US started the uh, uh, trilateral security dialogue some 13 years ago and they have been regularly uh, having the so-called two plus two meetings, uh, foreign ministers and defense ministers from three countries uh, meeting biennially. And the proceedings of the trilateral security dialogue was published and during those early years, you know, I, I try to follow what's written in those meeting records. But after a few times, I stopped doing that because they looked quite identical from one meeting to the next. They are always talking about non-traditional security threats. You know, sometimes you change, you know, according to the most recent event, you know, could be piracy in one year, but, you know, next time the tsunami was the first thing to be mentioned and so forth. So, uh, but uh, they stayed away from uh, naming China as a threat in the trilateral security dialogue in early years. That has changed now. Everybody 
well, maybe except India and to a lesser extent Australia, still uh, reluctant to name China as a threat, but Japan has signed on to that. And US and Japan both call China as a threat. So uh, in any case, because of this uh, the earlier trilateral cooperation among Japan, Australia, and the United States, again, talking about Australia is not very new. In, in fact, I, I, I wrote a journal article back in 2008 on Japan-Australia uh, relations, and uh, and I wasn't the first. Uh, somebody else was already publishing article, like Takashi Terada at the uh, uh, Doshisha University. He uh, he also wrote a paper on that. So anyway, uh, so what's left? That's India. And India Japan ties okay, are getting less attention in the Western world. But I started visiting India during the last maybe uh, six years or so. I, I was invited to a conference in Chennai first, and then I, uh, I went to Delhi a couple of times. And when I talk to the Indian IR scholars, they had such a high hope for closer cooperation with Japan. And there was a kind of a gap between Japan and India in their mutual expectation. I mean, to be sure, the Japanese political leaders were already actively uh, meeting the, the Indian political leaders from about mid 1990s. But then it was uh, uh, very soon it was uh, interrupted because of India's uh, nuclear testing. So uh, the official ties were suspended for a few years. But uh, the scholarly interests continued, and by early 2000, political relationship was resumed when Japan and the US both decided that uh, India is indeed a partner of growing importance for both the United States and Japan. So uh, from that time on, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi, for example, uh, started developing, cultivating closer uh, relationship with Indian Prime Minister. And the summit level uh, engagement has continued quite steadily since then. So this kind of special relationship has been there at the political level. But uh, among the Japanese scholars of international relations, India remained a kind of underdog. And I think that's simply because not enough people were studying India and too many people were you know, looking eastward, you know, still seeing the United States as the most important, and in some cases, the only credible security partner of Japan. So they didn't pay attention to countries other than the United States and its direct allies, like South Korea and Australia, in some cases, uh, the NATO allies, like the United Kingdom. Even today, you don't see many Japanese scholars who can speak of 
international relations of South Asia or foreign policy of India. So, uh, you know, when there are topics on India-Japan relations, you know, uh, on webinars, you know, my, my friend, uh, Professor Nagao is uh, prolific because he's one of those few people who have, you know, studied South Asia from early on. So, but in, in India, I was surprised to see so many people actually do study Japanese foreign policy, Japanese security policy, and they are very knowledgeable about Japan. So this gap really surprised me when I uh, went to India. And, and frankly, I, I had to study myself in order to catch up with uh, the, the level of knowledge they had about Japan. So that uh, I had to study Indian foreign policy and security policy in order to uh, make a, a good discussion with them. So, but long story short, uh, the talk today will focus uh, on Japan's relation with India more than uh, the other partners. Okay. So let me share the screen uh, here. Okay, uh, here we go. Okay, so the kind of uh, international environment Japan is seeing, not for the immediate future, but uh, for a kind of midterm projection. We are in 2021, but uh, you know, looking forward 10 years, 20 years, the world will look different. But right now, what is clear, you can identify some trends, such as the China is rising, and the United States is on a relative decline, not the absolute decline, but the relative decline. China's growth rate has been higher than the United States and China has narrowed the gap with the United States. If the trend continues, China will catch up. That's one. And the two, the China may catch up with the United States, but China's reign as the number one economic power and possibly a military power will not likely last for long because China itself will slow down. China has a demography issue because of its past one China policy. Its population will start uh, declining. And it's also aging rather rapidly. So unless China changes something, China's growth is destined to slow down. Whereas India is having a growing population and its economic growth rate is now high. India used to suffer from lower growth than China and because of uh, uh, so many issues, lack of competitiveness, corruption, you know, the overly regulative bureaucracy and so forth. You know, India is still like, acting like a socialist, whereas China is you know, very much like a capitalist now. So uh, but India is now growing and India is ex expected to surpass China at some point during this century. 
the one of the forecasts I've seen by the Economist magazine is uh, predicting that India will catch up by 2050. So, uh, so that will leave the world into a sort of tripolar competition among India, US, and China. And Japan will not be part of the big three anymore. Currently, Japan is one of the big three, but uh, Japan will re recede to a uh, smaller, smaller power status. So a lot of uh, Japanese scholars are talking about this uh, kind of near future Japan. Professor Soeya, uh, whom I just uh, was talking about earlier before the session start with uh, Professor Assembel, is uh, my mentor at Keio University. And he has been making this argument that uh, Japan should learn to act as a middle power. He deliberately doesn't use the word such as great power or major power. But Sometimes he's misunderstood because of this use of the term middle power. He is indeed advocating a quite active Japanese security role under this terminology. But uh, I think he's more in favor of uh, the multilateral participation than Japan staking the enhanced security role on solely on the bilateral alliance with the United States or even the US centered quad. So he's trying to differentiate his argument from uh, 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 those uh, US Japan bilateralism and its extension by deliberately using the term middle, middle power diplomacy. In any case, Japan will be something that is not a great power. Yeah. Despite Japan's dissenting and relative decline of the United States and so forth, the Indo-Pacific region is a growth center of the world economy. Even today already, the broadly defined Indo-Pacific is host to two thirds of the world economy. If you use a purchase power parity figure, If you use a real exchange rate figure, then it's not quite that big, but still the Indo-Pacific is the biggest economic block already. And uh, because of the higher growth rate, it is expected to grow even bigger. So you can see that here, the, the pink is the United States and Canada together. And if you add Mexico to that, then you will see the NAFTA zone, North American free trade area zone. And the green part is European Union. The blue part on the top is what is known presently as the Asia Pacific. 
But then、uh, actually, Australia is not in there. Australia is on the bottom, the brown part. So you can add Australia to the Asia Pacific. So it, it's the biggest of the three blocks already.、Yeah. So this growing in the Pacific will be the envy of the European Union and the North American bloc. Everybody wants to engage. With the Indo Pacific, because otherwise it will be left out of the greatest economic bloc. So here is the projection, some of the projections here. The present day G7, the global seven countries, will be replaced by E7, the emerging seven economies. China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, and so forth. And Japan is receding down to number eight economy by 2050. So、uh, it's going to be a very different world. For countries like Turkey, I think this is very significant because you know, after the BRICS will be、uh, you know, the next group of emerging countries, and Turkey, South Africa, they are part of that grouping. The United States renamed its military command recently. and Now, there is no US Pacific Command in Honolulu, Hawaii, but it's called Indo Pacific Command. Some people point out this change of command name and make an argument that now the US is. Extending its interest from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean. And here is the evidence. So I, I tell them, you are wrong. US has always been interested in the Indian Ocean when the command in Honolulu was named US Pacific Command. US 7th Fleet stationed in Yokosuka, Japan. Had an area of responsibility over the Western Pacific and the entire Indian Ocean region. I remember when I was working in the previous job with the US Defense Department, the Asia Pacific Center of Security Studies invited the mid rank military officers to. Come to Honolulu and study for uh, uh, about、uh, 12 weeks in our program. And the countries from the so called area of responsibility of the US Pacific Command were sending fellows to Honolulu. And one of my good students. Was from Madagascar. In Madagascar is an island down here, which is not inside the US Indo Pacific Command anymore, but it used to be under the Pacific Command.、Yeah. Because all the island countries in the Indian Ocean region, like Comoro, Seychelles, Maldives, They were under the US Pacific Command. So, so that is my evidence that the US was always interested in the Indian Ocean region.、Yeah. For Japan, this、uh, Indian Ocean region is part of the very important sea lane which Japan utilizes for. Commercial trading. 
the oil tankers coming from North Africa and the Middle East region, they all have to cruise through the Indian Ocean region before going through narrow passages in Southeast Asia, such as the Malacca Strait, number one, or the Lombok Strait, number three, between the island of Java and uh, Lombok, right here. Excuse me, not Java, Bali and Lombok. The, the biggest super tankers have to take this route because uh, the Malacca Strait is too narrow and too winding. So it's a navigational hazard for the super tankers. So they would rather go through a wide open and deeper channel between Bali and Lombok. But there are a couple of other choke points and I'm not gonna go into further details. But the point is Southeast Asia is a very important uh, sea range of communication for Japanese commercial vessels. Well, the big part of this South, Southeast Asian Sea is actually the South China Sea. And as you know, China claims a big portion of it and Chinese claims are in dispute with claims of other littoral countries such as Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and the Philippines. So the South China Sea disputes are of great interest for Japan and the rising tensions in recent years, concurrently rising with the tension in East China Sea, which is further uh, northeast of the South China Sea, past Taiwan into uh, the Okinawan chain of islands, that area. The tensions concurrently happening in both seas are raising the level of Japanese interest in the South China Sea disputes. Yeah. Both in terms of uh, the need for anchor US commitment to both regions and also the need to work at uh, making legal defense against Chinese claims and cooperating with Southeast Asian countries in capacity building for the littoral coast guard forces. So Japan is more active in the South China Sea area during the last uh, three, four years. The US has been using the term FOIP, free, open, and, free and open Indo-Pacific, F-O-I-P. Whereas Japan earlier used the FOIP acronym, but now Japan has added prosperous. So now it's a FOPIP. <laughs> it's very difficult to pronounce. The word, additional word prosperous is actually shared by India as well. India didn't want to use FOIP. So Japan and India together decided to add the word prosperous to this uh, acronym. The prosperous adds uh, economic dimension to the FOIP. The earlier US use of FOIP was uh, too militarily focused 
with the connotation of military containment of China. And Japan did not like that term. Japan's trade, the number one trade partner is actually China. China is Japan's number one source of import and number third destination of export. Japan runs trade deficit with China, but not to worry too much about it because export from China, quite a large part of it, uh, actually uh, uh, by uh, the Japanese subsidiaries and the completed product exports from China actually contain a lot of Japanese made components which were imported into China in order to be assembled in China. So Japanese economy and Chinese economy have been very closely integrated over the past uh, three decades of China's economic growth. Japan uh, started providing uh, official development assistance to China, big infrastructure loans. So I remember back in the early 1980s when the southern coastal cities of China, like, like Shenzhen, was not much more than the farmland with some towns. And back then, Japan decided that uh, the Shenzhen will be converted into an industrial zone. And the Chinese government designated the special economic zones and invited foreign investment, primarily Japanese investors. And, and back then, the factory owners, you know, those more adventurous early Japanese investors in Shenzhen, they were complaining to the Japanese government. You, know, you encouraged us to invest in China. So we built factories in China for manufacturing, whatever. And, but the power supply in China is so unstable. And every day the factories are forced to shut down for a couple of hours. And, you know, every time the factories don't get the electricity, it's a loss for them. So they were telling the Japanese company, you know, do something and, you know, the Chinese need a better infrastructure. So the Japanese government helped China build power plants and, you know, road, ports, all those infrastructure development was assisted by big Japanese loans. Well, not anymore. Since 2008, Japan stopped the new approval of long-term infrastructure loans to China and shifted the, the loan to India and Indonesia. So China is now considered not a developing country anymore, somewhere in between, middle-income country. But Japan still trades quite heavily with North America. So for Japan, negotiating uh, TPP and RCEP concurrently made a perfect sense. TPP with the United States and uh, all of the, uh, uh, not all of, <laughs> some of the ASEAN countries, Australia, New Zealand, more progressive free trade with the Pacific partners, whereas RCEP includes China, Korea, and all of the Southeast Asian countries, and India, Australia, New Zealand. So some membership are overlapping between them. 
But for Japan, negotiating two agreements concurrently and leveraging one against the other to make their contents as free as possible was, was the tactic, negotiation tactic. But of course, Japan's dream didn't quite materialize. Two quad partners actually torpedoed Japan's initiatives. You know, when Donald Trump pulled the United States out of TPP, that was a big blunder for Japan. But in the end, Japan decided to salvage the TPP negotiation by uh, playing a leading role within that grouping and decided to wait for the post-Trump United States to return to the negotiation. But, you know, will Biden bring the US back into TPP? So far, I'm quite pessimistic, but that's quite another topic. So I will not go further on that. The RCEP, in the last minutes, so uh, uh, put out by India, where we suspected that might happen. So it wasn't quite a surprise. As I said earlier, India is still a very much socialist economy and you know, free trade for India would mean a lot of jobs will be lost to China and other Southeast Asian countries. So that is no good for India. But the India has been interested in closer economic relations with Southeast Asian countries and with Japan. So uh, Japan has been aiding India with uh, a kind of transportation corridor initiatives Bay of Bengal economic corporations, development in northeastern part of India, which is more strategic because you know India is afraid that uh, you know China might breathe through that part of Indian territory and cut it off from India. So uh, India wants to enhance connectivity of northeastern India with the rest of India. And, and Japan is actively helping India with that. Japan also talks about uh, connectivity with uh, uh, African countries, especially those on the East Coast of Africa. And part of Japan's uh, free, open, and prosperous Indo-Pacific initiatives does talk about the, the TCAD, the Tokyo Initiative, you know, Tokyo International Conference for uh, African Development and African Connectivity Infrastructure, infrastructure Projects. Well, the TCAD existed before Japan launched FOIP idea. So you could say that it's a uh, old wine in a new bottle to some degree, that's true. It's a repackaging of the existing initiatives and not very much new money has been uh, actually allocated so far. But India and Japan together are discussing uh, helping the African connectivity to the Indian Ocean region. So. Uh, Maybe some will, new project will happen. Japan is hoping that the India's connection with uh, African countries through the expats Indian population in Africa might, might be conducive to uh, making investments in Africa. The sea lane connectivity issues go further into the Red Sea and Suez Canal. Any kind of terror activities in these narrow passages or 
naval competition there and blockade, things like that would threaten Japan's interest. Uh, for last decade, the piracy of Somalia was a big issue and Japan has dispatched the self-defense forces to the Gulf of Aden. And Japan also opened its first overseas military base in the country of Djibouti and the maritime surveillance plane has been stationed there and constantly patrolling the skies above the Sea of Aden and uh, the Arabian Sea. Djibouti is an interesting case because Japan's base, US base, Chinese base are uh, right next to each other. So major powers are competing for presence in Djibouti and uh, the broader uh, the Sea of Aden region. It's quite ironic that after all those concerns about piracy and rival navies, what blocked this passage was one Japanese commercial vessel which <laughs> grounded itself in the Suez Canal. Now the company is sued for billions of dollars of damage and I don't know what's going to happen about that case. But anyway, uh, that's one choke point security issue. The other, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, the Persian Gulf and the Hormuz Strait, this area has always been a security issue. And the, the currently rising tension between US and Iraq, Iran, excuse me, uh, has uh, caused a couple of incidents and the US requested Japan to send a naval patrol into the Gulf region, but Japan declined to send the ship into the uh, Strait of Homs. So instead the Japanese ship is patrolling outside in the Arabian Sea. Yeah. All of these coincide with China's Belt and Road initiatives, which India sees as China's neighbor strategy to contain India. China emphasizes its commercial aspects and transportation infrastructure connectivity, but uh, US, Japan, India, Australia, they are somewhat suspicious of China's true motivations. The China's uh, so-called debt trap uh, approach to some of the uh, poorer countries in the region, like indebted, indebted Sri Lanka, which could not repay the Chinese loans. They were forced into uh, leasing one of the port to Chinese company on the 99 year lease. 99 year lease. That's the kind of term British demanded China of Hong Kong. So is that the case of neocolonialism by China? It's quite possible. And the political influence for naval use of port in the future is something quad countries suspect. So Japan's views of India and China. Okay. China is the present biggest partner, but in the future, India will be equally important or more important possibly. But so far, Chinese economy is more capitalistic than India's. So doing business in India is still quite complicated and rapid expansion of private direct investments into India cannot be hoped. You know, the political leaders 
for security strategic reasons, uh, telling the Japanese companies to divest from China and invest into Vietnam, other Southeast Asian countries, and India. But the business have their own logic. And the shift has not occurred to a great extent yet. But the government loan priority has already shifted from China to India. And China is an immediate security concern in the neighborhood. And Japan is not meeting this challenge with only military means, but uh, diplomacy, economic engagement are part of Japan's uh, strategy to, to mend the potential threat from China. So I already talked about the Indian Ocean uh, maritime interest for Japan. So I'll skip this slide. And India, like Japan, sees a regional multipolarity. That's what India wants. India wants to have multiple parties present in the Indian Ocean region and balancing against each other. Simply because India alone cannot balance any one of them. So India engages in selective cooperation, not a full cooperation with quad partners, US, Australia, Japan, and some others like Vietnam. Indian naval visit to Vietnam, arms sales, those things are growing in recent years. And Vietnam sees its relation with India and its relation with Japan in a similar way. Vietnam doesn't want to antagonize China by getting too close to India or too close to Japan. So they are preferring limited engagement. So Japanese views and Indian views are quite uh, complementary with each other. India's naval power can be a counterbalance to China's and India's military power maximizes Japan's security interest in the Indian Ocean region. Okay. But two countries are far away, which have its own disadvantage. Japan cannot expect India to do much if China causes trouble in the East China Sea, for example. Although I said that uh, the policy shift and the Abe was no surprise. I would still emphasize that the Japanese pacifist constitution still matters, still matters. Yeah. Multilateral collective defense is very hard to do under the Japanese constitution. And despite the interpretation by Abe, the constitution still puts a break on fully multilateralizing alliance. Yeah. Both Japan and India do not want to upset China unnecessarily. So they are more defensive. They don't want to provoke China. The role of US works differently. US and India have no alliance and India will not enter alliance with the United States unless things get terribly bad for India. So those are inhibiting factors. Yes, I'll skip this one. A couple of quotes here. The problem which is of immediate interest to both India and Japan, and which is also likely to affect peace and stability in Asia is the challenge posted by China. 
You think this quote is from recent years, but actually it's from 1967. There is a great geopolitical continuity in this region. Okay. Uh, skip this one. Just go to a final slide. Oops, sorry. Oui. Okay, here. Yeah. So what we are seeing is uh, the kind of bifurcation of countries on the security board, US, Japan, Australia, India getting closer, but India is still somewhat hedging near the middle. And on the economic board, actually, China and India are not too far apart. They are, you know, closer in terms of uh, more uh, nationalistic, protectionist economic integration, not a full liberal integration. And the US is in the same way, but within a grouping of its own. And Japan and Australia are stuck in between talking about real free trade. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of uh, the image Japan has of Quad and the Indo-Pacific and partnerships in this region. So I'll stop here and uh, we can have some questions.